And there's a request to look at something that is a religious belief held and cherished by many. And we should look at what is the capacity, the capacity, the ability of a human being to obey God. <laughs> Can you do so? And there is an ancient doctrine about this. Um, people from very long ago, it's not a new thing, it's not a European thing by any means. It's not even an Israelite thing. We're looking in the book of Job today at an ancient belief, an ancient religious system about the ability of human beings to obey. We're looking at the friends of Job. You have a few of them here, Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. And uh, all three of them, and one other fella, basically hold the same belief. They have a belief system in which, you know, they have a definition of reverence that is not correct. <laughs> They're thinking that to revere God, to respect God, to um, have God in his rightful place means that, well, I have to engage in fairly active self abasement, self-flagellation, and that somehow God is exalted when I uh, talk bad about myself or my abilities. Uh, that's not actually true. But that's what people think. Um, people sometimes think that human effort somehow is contrary to God, that it mean, you know, if we have to do something, or if we're expected to do something, or if we even can do something that actually helps us to be saved, well, then that somehow is overstepping the line into God's work, that you're whittling on God's end of the stick. Um, that's the idea of many, that if we think our effort has something to do with it, well, we are being very arrogant about that, because we think too highly of ourselves when you know, it's you know, God who does everything that is good. That's what people think. That is not correct. But they think that in reverence, if you will. And they also think that it's piety. That is, it's a genuine religion, a genuine concern for spiritual things. If we accept stuff that doesn't make sense. Uh, and to be true or to be fair, there are things that are not revealed and that we don't know, and those things belong to God, and that's how it is. But certainly, uh, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, according to the Apostle Peter. Everything we need to know has been given us, but I think that people are a little too willing to go down the path of, well, this, this doesn't make sense, or this is not consistent, especially with the Bible. But we're going to accept that as faith, you know, and that will be counted as piety, even though we don't get it or even though it seems inconsistent. Um, this also is taken to be reverence that, well, God must be right. And, and uh, he said it and it doesn't seem to make sense to me, but it, it must be it must be right. Well, that's a mistake as well. God spoke with the intent that you and I would hear. And uh, he made the tongue and he made the ear. So I think he can get us a word that we can understand. That makes sense. But this is the idea in this, this ancient religion, and I think it's maybe the oldest of them uh, that is contrary to God, is something like reverence. I mean, they're thinking that all of these things exalt God in some way. And so you will hear them. And now we're going to read through the quotations from Job's friends and want you to see these things for yourself. Here are the kinds of things that they say. One of them begins in Job 4 at verse 17. Can mortal man be in the right before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? Look, even in his servants, he puts no trust. His angels, he charges with error. How much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust? That's Job 4, 17 through 19. So you hear one of them saying, as we read, that, well, it's not even possible. 
mortal man cannot be in the right before God. Man cannot be pure before his maker. Well, like any lie of the devil, there's some truth to it. <laughs> it's true that we need God in order to be forgiven. It's true that we need grace, that we cannot pay God back for our sins, that we need an offering. But it's not because we're mortal. It's not because we're made of dust, as he points out accurately. We, we do dwell in houses of clay. <laughs> we are made out of dust. Yeah, but that's not why. Um, you'll hear people think this way, though, that because we are just dust, we're just human frames, well, it's not even possible to be right. Uh, you're made out of dirt. How can you even be pure? Dirt is dirty. <laughs> Another place begins at Job 15, verse 4, where one of the friends says, What is man that he can be pure? Or he born of woman that he can be righteous? Behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones. The heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less one who is abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. So you see some of the aspects of that false reverence, this self-abasement, self-flagellation, talking bad about ourselves. This, I would say, is a false humility. They probably perceive it as genuine humility, but it's not real humility. Real humility would be obeying God. But they say man is abominable and corrupt. The man drinks injustice. In the 25th chapter, at verse 4, how can man be in the right before God? How can he, born of woman, be pure? Even the moon is not bright, the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less man, a maggot, the son of man, a worm? And you do hear people talk this way um, in religious circles. I, I remember well, as a young person, it's true that I used to be one of those <laughs> at one time. Um, you know, I would be invited to studies and devotionals, which only Baptists had in those days, by the way. Uh, that was weird when I heard churches doing, I'm like, what? That's Baptist. It always has been. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Where's that in the Bible? But, you know, they'd invite you to these things and you'd go and they would talk about, you know, various things. But you would hear people talk this way that, you know, oh, I'm just a maggot. I'm worthless to God. I have no value to him. You know, he's just so merciful that he lets us live and draw breath. Um, again, there's some truth to that, but not like this. That's what these guys are saying, though. They're not, you know, my Baptist friends were not the first ones to say it, is my point. <laughs> and John Calvin wasn't the first one to say it. and. You know, the Pharisees weren't the first ones to say it. Probably Job's friends aren't either, but this is where we get a nice little catalog. The fifth chapter, a different idea starts. We'll track this one through the friends. Affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground, but man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. Yes, you are born for trouble, you see? You are a maggot, you are a worm, you are made out of dust, you cannot obey, you are born for trouble, you are made sinful, sinful from birth. Uh, there's even a very popular Bible translation, the, the NIV, that says sinful from birth in, in, in the Psalms, I believe Psalm 52 or 51, I can't remember the number precisely, because I'm not the young person anymore, remember. but. Um, that's an old way of thinking. It's been around. In the 15th chapter, the friend says at verse 35, they conceive trouble and give birth to evil. Their womb prepares deceit. So this is wrong from the time of conception. It's not even possible to be born clean or pure, to be right. You're made out of dirt. 
Do you see the self-abasement? You see the inability of, of human effort or capability. And you see an acceptance of something that doesn't make sense. How can somebody, you know, this child, pure as the driven snow, a newborn child, be dirty? <laughs> That's not, that doesn't make any sense. But if you say that, you're arrogant. See, that's how they think. Job 11 captures it from the mouth of a friend we did not name, and that's fine. A foolish young man. But he's there to attack Job. And this gets more to the point for us. We're going to start zooming out and thinking about who is this Job and why is this happening? But in Job 11, you say, my doctrine is pure and I am clean in God's eyes. Well, that's actually true. Job is right when he says this. The friend thinks that's a problem. He tells him in verse 6, know then that God ex exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. So this sounds like reverence. It sounds like respect for the Almighty. It's a self-abasement. It is uh, discounting human effort, the ability of the human to be right before his maker. And it sounds like, you know, this fellow is taking a, a strong stand against Job, who obviously has done something wrong because a lot of terrible things have happened to him. His children died. They lost all of his modes of income and providing for his family. He has lost his health. He's covered from head to toe in these terrible boils. Um, they've come, they've seen this great loss, this calamity, and have concluded, well, he must have done something wrong. That's the way the world thinks. In the 10th verse, if God passes through and imprisons and summons the court, who can turn him back? Here is that, quote unquote, pious acceptance of something that doesn't make sense. This belief that God comes through and arbitrarily decides who is guilty and who is innocent, arbitrarily decides who is going to be saved and who is going to be condemned. Who will be with him in heaven and who will be with him in hell is entirely up to him. And he comes and makes this decision. Who's going to fight him on this? And they do the same with Romans 9. Who has, uh, you know, who has uh, uh, resisted his will? Will the clay say to the, to the potter, why have you made me like this? Uh, they take that verse and they think that has to do with your personal salvation which is not even close to anything to do with the context of Romans 9, which is talking about the decision that salvation would come through the nation of Israel, which is why it comes through Jacob, not through Esau, why Israel was chosen to leave Egypt, why Pharaoh was stood up so he could be knocked down, not so he could go to hell, but so he could lose his kingdom and lose his power, and that would glorify God without any reference to whether or not he might be able to repent later. It's, not got, it's got nothing to do with that. It's about the choice of Israel as the nation for salvation. But like I said, that is seen as piety. This acceptance of something that doesn't actually make sense is not consistent, does not follow. That's called piety. And if you argue with it, you are called arrogant. Because you're overstepping your bounds. You don't respect God like you should. We have reverence. You guys are work salvationists. That's what they say. In Job 34, the friend continues, Job has said it profits a man nothing that he should take delight in God. Uh, there is something true about this insofar as godliness is not a means of gain. You don't become a Christian so that everything in life goes easy for you from now on, because that's not the truth. That's not how it is. The Christian life is the best life, and 
choosing what is good and choosing what is right very often, typically, helps you to sidestep many of life's worst problems. Many things in this world that are the worst things, you can avoid those things by living a godly life. God would turn you, um, you know, from, from substance abuse. God would turn you from a life of crime or theft, from dishonesty, from abuse, abusive relationships. God, it, living godly will turn you from those things and steer you clear. And yet you will actually, I think, you have a better life. But that's not the promise of salvation. Salvation is in the spirit, and we have a promise of a future. We have a promise of victory in the judgment day. No promises about what happens here on earth, whether it's good or whether it's evil. That's, that's not given. So to say it profits man nothing that he should take delight in God is, is kind of twisting what Job is saying. <laughs> Job is saying that whether you profit or whether you lose in this life is no indicator of whether you're right. And that is correct. Whether you profit or whether you lose is no indicator of whether you're right with God. Which I realize is anathema in this society. But this man continues to rebuke Job from there, beginning at verse 10 of Job 34. Hear me, men of understanding, so the rest of you guys listen up. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, from the Almighty that he should do wrong. Okay, well, yeah, that's true. But it's discounting something that is real. This is ignoring the existence and the activity of Satan. There is an enemy who does do wrong and does do evil. And while he is given limits, he's not prevented from doing everything. According to the work of a man, he will repay him. According to his ways, he'll make it befall him, said that one. And that's the religion of the world. Remember, in, you may remember in John 9, when Jesus walked by a man who had been born blind, his disciples asked him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus said, neither. He was born blind so that the works of God could be shown in him. But people really think that, that these bad things happen to you because you are bad, and good things happen to you because you are good. <laughs> That's human religion. That's ancient. But let's ask the question now, what does God say about it? Because that's the important thing, isn't it? And here's where we zoom out. This is the book of Job. The fact is that our friend Job has suffered a terrible loss of all things. But what those friends don't know and what Job does not know in the conversation that they are having between themselves recorded here in chapters 3 through, I don't know, 30-something, 30 38, 39, something like that. What they don't know is the conversation that God had with Satan that led to Job's loss of all things. The purpose of Job, I would say, is to lay this out for us so that we can understand not just that suffering um, may not be the consequence of sin directly. Like you, you may suffer and it may have nothing to do with some sin you've done, but it's there to help us understand that uh, sometimes very precisely the reason that you suffer is because you are living right. Sometimes it's the exact opposite of what people think. Now, the reason that things may be going badly for you, or the reason that something befalls you, some malady or difficulty, may well be that you are doing right, that you are living right, and you are being tested. That happens. And so, 
in part, it's an encouragement to us to understand that, well, you keep moving, you keep going. There are troubles, there are things that happen, and they're horrible things. Losses in life, loss of loved ones, loss of health, loss of property and money. But you keep going. You keep faithful to the Lord your God. So consider what actually happened. We're told in Job 1, beginning at verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. So his friends telling him, God exacts of you less than your sins deserve is absolutely wrong. That's false. Job, according to God, is not like anybody else on earth. <laughs> At the time, he was doing right and right, right, blameless and upright, fears God, turns from evil. That's what God said about him. Job's friends saying, can man be pure before his maker? Well, if you're asking honestly, the answer is here. A blameless and upright man. Yes, you can be pure before the maker. You can live right and be accepted by God. It is possible to do it. And because this is happening, Satan says to the Lord, does Job fear God for no reason? Haven't you put a hedge around him in his house, everything he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Well, God is never going to stretch out his hand and curse everything. That's not what God does. However, he does tell Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The response of God, or I'm sorry, the, the response of Satan to this is, well, Job is only serving you because everything has gone well for him. He's been blessed. He's had everything that he needs. You know, if he didn't have material goods, well, he would curse you. And the Lord allows Satan to take away those material goods. And he does more than that. He takes away his family members too, his children. But God does allow it to happen. We, we are tested. We are tempted. Uh, sometimes terrible things happen, and they are exactly because of spite and hatred. That is Satan. We have an adversary. And that's the thing that is missing in the calculations of that human religion, that human thinking about our inabilities, our lack of capacity. They're missing this concept that, no, there is an adversary. There is somebody who actively seeks your harm. And bad things happen in life because of that. Well. As we mentioned, he took everything material, and he also took the lives of Job's children. And Job said, God has given and God has taken away. Blessed be the Lord. We accept, you know, we accept blessings from the Lord. Shall we not accept adversity? He did not sin with his lips. He, he did no wrong. And so Satan and the Lord are having a conversation in heaven again in the second chapter of Job, where the Lord says to him a second time, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil, which means this is not changed. The fact that all of his material goods are taken away and even his family is taken away has not changed his basic 
character, his nature, which is he still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. That is correct. Satan acts without reason. And it is that without reason that people think should be accepted as revealed truth in pious reverence for God. No. God is not the author of confusion. Satan is the author of confusion. Speaking of confusion, what is integrity? Well, uh, hold fast your integrity. That means he protests his innocence. When he says he holds fast his integrity, he means he's holding on to the idea that he is being completely honest. He's completely truthful. He has not done something wrong. He's not done something that warrants the evil things you see befalling him. That's what we mean by this. Hold fast your integrity. It means he, mean, he maintains his innocence. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. So God says he is innocent. A blameless and an upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And that the destruction Satan planned was without reason. It didn't make sense. But Satan comes back, as he always does, skin for skin. All a man has will he give for his life. Meaning, you didn't let me touch him before, just what he had. So immediately we skip over the fact that he was wrong the first time. <laughs> But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And this happens too. People lose their health. They lose their lives. And the Lord said, behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan is not allowed to kill him at this time, as he was allowed to kill the children. But... He is allowed to take Job's health, and he does. Job suffers the loss of everything. And yet, when he's talking with his friends, saying he had done nothing wrong, all they could do was accuse him of doing wrong, saying it was in his nature. He was made out of dust. It wasn't even possible for him to not be wrong. Um, that he was arrogant, overstepping his boundaries with God. You know, all the things that we read. But in the end there, we have Job 42. In the end, when God confronts them all and speaks directly to Job and to Job's friends, whose words we read, he tells them this in Job 42, at verse 7, the Lord said to Eliphaz, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. And this is the point at which we stop and we say, did you think that what they were saying was right? When you read those words, is that what you believe? Well, I hope it isn't, because if it is, then God is angry with you, because that is not right. What they said is not right. What Job said is right. It tells us he was innocent. He was blameless. He was godly. And because of this, he suffered loss. And despite the losses that he suffered, which are terrible, almost unfathomable, he nonetheless remained innocent and did not sin against God. When the friends came with the human religion, the human ideas about the sinful nature of man, the inability of man to obey God, uh, God's you know, unconditional election of individuals to be saved or to be condemned, the Lord said, my anger burns against you because you have not spoken about me what is right. That's a false religion. It's ancient, but it's false. That's not the truth. 
Now we mentioned the fact that Satan is in heaven, or at least in the in the throne room there, having that conversation where he accuses us. That's an adversary, but we also have an advocate. Some of us do. You have to reckon with the fact that there is a Satan. There is an, an evil that seeks our harm. And it's not rational. And it's not conf- or, uh, it doesn't make sense. It's confusing. But that's what he is. And that's what he does. How are you going to fight that? <laughs> yeah. That's where you need an advocate, right? And Job observed this. One of the things that he said very acutely, Job 9, 32 to 33, was that God is not a man as I am, that I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. That's exactly right. Job has a very basic problem. God is not a man that he could go to court with him. (laughs) There's not an arbiter between God and man who lays hand on both, meaning has both the understanding of the divinity and also the understanding of the humanity. That's something that Job pines for an arbiter, an umpire, uh, a go-between. Or as 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says, a mediator. There is one God, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. This Jesus is the one who lays hands on both. He has the divinity and understands the concerns and the desires of God. And he also has the humanity and understands our sufferings, our trials. And he is the one mediator. The anointed is the meaning of the Christ. He's the anointed. He's God's chosen king. Whom God has appointed between us and him as the mediator, the go-between. What Job did not have and pined for is what we now receive in Jesus Christ. An arbiter to go between the two, to speak on our behalf in court. And I would turn your attention to the second chapter of Hebrews on this point. The children, that's us, share in flesh and blood. That is, you and I all have flesh and blood. We are humans. Since we are flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. What same things? Flesh and blood. You see how it says likewise and partook and same. (laughs) That's fairly emphatic for telling us Our flesh and blood is his flesh and blood. They're the same. He did this so that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. He suffered death. He suffered a terrible, agonizing death on a cross for us. Yeah, he does know what it is to hurt and to suffer and to be treated unjustly, despite the fact that he did no wrong. But the major part, the major point of Hebrews 2 here, and the point that we're making, is that he does lay hand on us both. Where God is not a man that we should go to court with him, Jesus is that mediator between God and man. He had flesh and blood as you and I have flesh and blood, but he also had the Holy Spirit of God, where you and I have human spirits. 
17th verse said he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, in every respect. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Why did he have to be? It had to be so, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a satisfying sacrifice for the sins of the people. Because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. But did you see Hebrews 2.17? Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. What does that mean? It means if he did not have flesh and blood as you and I have flesh and blood, then he is not the mediator. That's what that means. If he did not have a body like you and I have a body, then we're still in Job 9.33, waiting for somebody who can lay hands on both of us. But thanks be to God, that's not where we are. Jesus did have flesh and blood. He does have a body as you and I have a body. This is the meaning. And he knows what it is to be tempted. Therefore, he can help those of us who are being tempted. But you have to understand that if he didn't have a body, as you and I have a body, then he's not a mediator. If he didn't have flesh and blood like you and I have flesh and blood, then he cannot be the high priest. That's the thing that people miss. They're happy to accept this idea that we are born sinful, that we are conceived in sin. Well, the Bible never says anything like it. Yes, I know the NIV does. Don't use that one. The Bible doesn't say that. But they never deal well with the problem that Jesus was born to marry a human being in the flesh. <laughs> he was conceived in Mary, a human being, in the flesh. If man is born for trouble, then how did Jesus have a pure body, a sinless body? If man is conceived in sin, how was Jesus conceived? And this, you know, you'll hear all kinds of explanations. Various religions have various things. I think my favorite one is the Immaculate Exception, uh, Conception. Um, but, you know, there's, they're all of them grasping at straws because they have the basic problem that they've accepted something that's false. No flesh is not inherently sinful. No flesh is not incapable of obeying God. That's not true. Jesus proved that that's not true. And he had flesh as you and I have flesh. If he wasn't born the same way you and I were born and was not subject to the same uh, constraints and capabilities that you and I have, then he wasn't our mediator either. It has to be so. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. That's what Hebrews says, and that's correct. It couldn't be any other way. And in 1 John 2, we speak about the advocate. My little children, I write this to you so that you may not sin. That's the first thing is the target is right living. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We accept the fact that nobody has achieved a sinless perfection. And we accept the fact that nobody is going to either. You're not going to get to a place in life where you no longer need the blood of Jesus. You no longer need forgiveness. You no longer need mercy. You have nothing to be sorry about. That's not going to happen. But you should try. <laughs> when we sin... It's because we choose to do so. God is always faithful to provide the way of escape, according to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 11 and 12. God always provides a way of escape with any temptation that you might be able to endure. When we sin, it's because we choose to do so. But yes, 
realistically, there are going to be occasions of sin. We won't get to that place of a sinless perfection. Nobody's, account, nobody's claiming that. Nobody is saying that that is realistic for you and for me. The accusations of the religious world, to the contrary, notwithstanding. You know, let them say what they want about obedience. Uh, God certainly do, does call us to it. As John said, I write this to you so that you may not sin. First thing is don't do it. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The advocate here is somebody called to your side. Um, this is sometimes used as a term for a lawyer or just a friend, but somebody who takes your side. This tells me that it's the answer. You know, First John 2, 1 is the answer to the conversations we read about in Job 1 and Job 2, where Satan, the adversary, is there to accuse you and say terrible things about you and impugn your motives and malign your character. The Lord, if you have the Lord, if you're a Christian, is an advocate there who can speak on your behalf about why perhaps this is a struggle for you. First John continues, chapter 2, verse 2, he is the satisfying sacrifice for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the entire world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Commandment keeping. People are real down on that. They're very upset with any kind of biblical hermeneutic that means we have to keep God's commands. And yet, John couldn't be any plainer. You can know whether or not you know God. Here's how you know. You've come to know God if you keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is wrong. The truth is not in that one. Whoever keeps his word in that person is the love of God perfected. Which is to say, his love for God has reached a maturity, which you know because he keeps God's word. By this we know we are in him. So first we know that we know him when we keep his commandments. We love him when we keep his word. But now we know that we are in him. In this way, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Well, how can you do that? Well, it's, the, you know, it hinges on the word same. Remember, he likewise partook of the same flesh and blood as you and I have flesh and blood. If we say we abide in him, well, we should walk in the way that he walked. What does it mean? Well, it's this. First John 3, 7, continuing, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. It's actually very simple. You can see the outcome in the choices the person makes, the life that the person lives, whether they obey God or they don't. They seek him and his commandments or they don't. The devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. We just read in Hebrews 2 how that he took on flesh that he might destroy the power of the devil, which is death, on our behalf to free us from lifelong slavery through fear of death. Now we read here, very similarly, the Son of God appeared in order to destroy the works of the devil. The reason he appeared to destroy the works of the devil, meaning he appeared so that you and I would live right so that we would obey God, so that we would find forgiveness. That's the idea. And it is a practice. John is not saying you will achieve sinless perfection. He very plainly is saying that's not realistic. We do have an advocate with the Father. Earlier in the first chapter, he said, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. Right. John understands that 
you're not going to get to that absolute perfection. Nobody's saying that. But he also understands that there's a difference between, you know, this occasion of something that didn't go the way it should have and the practice of sin. Christians are not to practice sin. It shouldn't be our habit, our normal, the way that we live. Because the Son of God appeared to destroy that. Our lives should be changed and transformed in the gospel of God. Shouldn't be our habit to do those things. So God is looking at the big picture. and We ought to do the same. Don't overlook sin. Don't overlook wrongdoing. But don't go down the false religion path of self-flagellation either. There's no hope in that path. We have hope because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you have that advocate. So the question today is, are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? Do you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous? Only if you have been baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. Do you have that advocacy on your behalf? Because that's when you put to death the old person of sin in order to be resurrected as he was, a new creature created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand to walk in them. We have water prepared to help you to obey that command of God for yourself if you realize your soul's lost a state at this time. If today... You are a Christian and have not lived right. Repent. Make things right before God. We have the example of praying and asking for the prayers of the saints in Acts chapter 8. We're certainly glad to pray with you and for you because, as noted, not one of us has achieved perfection. We need each other. We pray for one another. We build each other up. It's a safe place to be repentant. It's a safe place to... Uh, you know, to come to God and to seek him first. We'll try to help and, and build up and encourage each one. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to obey the gospel, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.